The cold case team returned to the Northwest because of dramatic new developments involving the Cooper story's last secret, the getaway. The details came from not one, but three separate sources with the same intertwining facts. The first was confidential FBI records released by federal court order. Then a long forgotten news article. And finally, an Oregon couple claiming a veteran pilot had told the escape play-by-play -play to a table of flyers at a private plane club. Now, 20 years later, these two are the last alive that know the storyteller's tale. He is a construction company owner and lifelong recreational flyer. She was a highly respected career cop. Don't be surprised if their introduction brings a chuckle. My name is Russ Cooper, no relation. I'm Christy Cooper, no relation to DB. Only related to Russ. <laughs> One of the reasons and the intrigues for me to become a pilot is the sense of community. We'll be taking off to the west and we'll rendezvous right over here, right over the airport. Every town has a hangout, but what makes the Northwest unique is its private flying clubs. For the last two decades, Russ was an exclusive member where he practiced celebrated milestones, told stories, and heard secrets. Back in 1997, one such secret teller was an 82nd Airborne Army veteran known as Wally. So the very serious Wally proceeded with a gripping story about a daring pilot he claimed to know. A pilot on November 24, 1971, near La Center, Washington, that was circling in storm clouds, waiting to fly the parachuting Cooper to freedom. Christy has been the driving force about coming out and talking about this. When he came forward with the story, it was intriguing to me just from the law enforcement aspect and solving a crime. I was extremely skeptical about the whole story to start with until we went to the different various locations and I could actually see visually how this would work and how it flowed and um, then I was pretty convinced. Cooper had come down and landed uh, roughly 1,300 feet from the airstrip. There was two gentlemen waiting for him. He went to the airstrip, Goheens. He was loaded into a small aircraft. $50,000 of the money was put in that aircraft in the briefcase bomb. They flew down the East Fork of the Lewis River, where they intersected with Lake River just before it dumps into the Columbia. And they flew up Lake River to Vancouver Lake, where $50,000 of the money and the bomb was dumped into the lake, so it would appear that he had went into the lake and drowned. They landed at Scapoose, they changed clothes. They boarded a different aircraft and they completed the circle back to Portland International where he boarded another flight. We did make an attempt to contact the FBI, and in discussions, he finally said, well, okay, you know, go ahead, make a try. So over a couple of few different times, we made attempts, and the door was just shut in our face. We couldn't get a phone call back. Nobody would answer the phone. We couldn't even get an agent on the phone. It was, it was amazing to me as being in law enforcement that nobody wanted to listen. My mother worked for the Bureau, so I grew up in a house with an autographed picture to a young woman from J. Edgar Hoover. I'd like to see this solved, and uh, I'd like to see the FBI brought back to where they used to be. Him and I were talking, I was like, yeah, Tom would probably be the right guy. Right now is the time. 
So that's when I picked up the phone, made the phone call. And you actually listened. <laughs> the $50,000 of Cooper money used in the alleged Vancouver Lake drowning stunt took nine years to surface. It happened when the FBI was alerted in 1980 to three Cooper cash bundles on the nearby Columbia River shore, lying half buried and still separated by their 1971 bank rubber bands. Well, you heard about the find of some of the D.B. Cooper stolen money out along the banks of the Columbia River just north of Vancouver. Our reporter Bill Van Amberg is on the scene along with a lot of FBI agents and it looks like they're still digging for more paper, right? That's exactly what you see behind me there, Richard. They are digging for more. These are FBI agents just trying to f see if they can find any more money and they have. Within about the last hour or so, they've been finding little chunks, little bits and pieces of uh, D.B. Cooper's $20 bills all over the place. I have with me now Dorwin Schrader, he's the FBI agent in charge of the scene here. Uh, if we can get a shot here, this is what we're talking about. These are the sizes that they have found. Now the original stuff found by the family out here on the beach was larger. This is all we found so far, a lot of these small type bills. Now I think also in another envelope we have here, if we can just kind of move this in. We have pieces. This is the largest piece uh, that we've found so far. Uh, it has a, a, almost the entire serial number on it, but most of the pieces are very much smaller, about the size of a dime or even smaller. Are you sure they're the $20 bills from the D.B. Cooper bunch? Yes, we are, because they're in the same vicinity where the original large uh, quantity of money was found, and we were able to find many, many serial numbers on that money, so we know it's the same. Let me just ask you one other thing. A lot of this earlier, the larger bills, were found closer to the surface, these later ones down lower. How long ago might it have been that they were buried? That's only speculation, but we can say that uh, some of this money was found two and three feet deep in the sand. Uh, without consulting uh, an authority on the river, I would just guess that it would be uh, four, five, six years. The Bureau would learn the thousands of deeply buried Cooper money shards had actually come from an old dredging at neighboring Vancouver Lake, but agents couldn't explain why. The cold case team, of course, believes the escape story now ends that mystery. My private investigators have located six witnesses that claim this long dead Portland drug dealer, Dick Briggs, had bragged of planting the surface bundles just days before they happened to be found. I firmly believe Briggs did this as a diversion for a confirmed seven-year crime partner by the name of Robert W. Rackstraw, an award-winning Vietnam pilot, explosives expert, paratrooper, a released FBI suspect, and the living subject of our cold case team's six-year Cooper quest. When the Briggs River connection became known, I realized the FBI had truly been outfoxed. Thanks to our PI team, the tide has finally turned. Christie recently read the team's investigative book on Rackstraw, which has been honored with three national awards for true crime. Rackstraw really has the personality, but also things that he did while he was in the Pacific Northwest, about searching the forest on a fake elk hunting trip, about working for a dredging company. Um, he was a pilot. He would be gone during the day, you know, flying over the area. He was scouting. Bill Baker is the former head of the FBI's Criminal Investigative Division and the team's most senior member. So he naturally was the first we asked to review these new developments. Look, this is a type, uh, I told you, this is a type of, it's more than theory, and you have an individual who has all of the attributes required of someone to do this successfully. Certainly it shows the detail and the thoroughness, not only that the FBI put into it, but that you and your team put into it too, to come up with these issues. I wish you luck, I appreciate or not that. luck, but uh, <laughs> success. Thank you, Bill. Wally's getaway story left one big question. What did the two men in the pickup truck do with the parachute and remaining $150,000? Wally had the answer. The other $150,000 in the parachute was loaded into a pickup that went to a specific uh, area and mountain. He named the mountain, but he couldn't possibly know that as a teenager, I spent a lot of time up there. I knew that area like the back of my hand. Wally and everyone else around that flying club table have passed on now. 
But thanks to Russ and Christie's deep research and old county maps, we believe we've found what everyone is looking for, the burial ground. With the private property owner's permission, we followed the crime team's methodical footsteps into a forest that many of us believe hides this story's last secret. 9-11. This is the area he described. I mean, this, this is how far in we need to be. We'll formulate a plan. Yeah. 